On your program, it had uh, President Gallagher was going to be here. Um, there's a lot going on at the university right now, and unfortunately, he was unable to make it. So, uh, Dr. Zoback, that may give you uh, just a few extra minutes. Um, so, as I said, the bios are, are in the packet. Um, Dr. Mark Zoback from Stanford, we have a long affiliation on energy and a number of things, but what's not in his bio is his leadership on energy, and especially on the coast where fossil fuels haven't exactly been the favorite fuel. Um, Mark's been a, a real advocate uh, for fossil fuels and their important role, and especially says we have to do it right. He's done a, a number of really impressive things in his career, besides being a world-class earthquake scientist and geophysicist. He was on the study committee for the Macondo disaster. Um, he actually drilled a well, deep well, into the San Andreas Fault and installed seismometers so they could watch the movement of it in real time uh, and started the Natural Gas Initiative at Stanford, really under the encouragement of Secretary George Shultz. So, Mark, kick us off. Well, thank you, Mike. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here and have the opportunity to, to start the conversations today. It looks like it's going to be a truly great day. You know, this is not an audience uh, that I need to uh, talk about the tremendous uh, advances that the, uh, the shale revolution has brought, the uh, tremendous increases in both uh, unconventional natural gas and unconventional oil that have not only changed the energy picture in the United States, but will do so uh, around the world. What I do want to do is just talk a little bit about addressing the unconventional development challenge. Uh, despite this success, there's much work that remains to be done. And I want to spend most of my time this morning sort of setting the stage for things that will come up throughout the day, and that is discuss the role of the oil and gas industry in the era of decarbonization. Now, there's a lot of data here, but I can uh, explain it to you very quickly. These are 45,000 wells from four major plays, the Eagleford, Marcellus, Bakken, and Barnett. And the data is divided into two-year cohorts, and there's hundreds to thousands of wells that define each line. So what it's showing on the left is the very familiar rapid decrease in production rate um, with time after two or three years. Uh, the production rates are considerably lower than, than they are initially. The graph on the right is cumulative production. And so as the uh, colors change, we're looking at different two-year epochs. And what we can see is in the Eagleford, production is about 40% on average, more per well than it was in the early days. In the uh, Bakken, it's about 40%. In the uh, Barnett, it was about 50%. And in the Marcellus, uh, the average well is about doubled in production. Now, this is both good news and bad news, right? We're, things are getting better. Uh, we're, we're doing a, a more effective job. But since I'm a geophysicist, let's start with the economics. And the economics are, are complicated. Obviously, uh, the resource price uh, fluctuations are, are a challenge and, and quite important. Uh, the past decade has seen tremendous increases in operational efficiency, and it, they're, they're truly remarkable. I don't think anyone would have predicted a decade ago how much more efficient operations are carried out today than they were then. But, the, the, you know, the fact of the matter is what has driven a lot of these increases uh, has been an increase in effort. The laterals are longer, there are more stages, more fluid and, and prop inter are being injected. So, um, you know, we're working harder, we're getting more hydrocarbons on average per well, but it's not the dramatic increase might, one might have hoped after 45,000 wells uh, shown here were drilled. And after a couple of hundred thousand wells, uh, you know, throughout um, North America, you know, the recovery factors uh, for dry gas are around 25 percent, and the recovery factors for tight oil are sort of in the single digits. So there's, we can do a lot better. And, uh, and there, you know, many uneconomic wells are, are still being drilled. 
And if you look at 2018, just as a metric of sort of the level of activity uh, in the lower 48, uh, the CapEx spending for drilling and completion was $77 billion. There's, there's, it's a big effort, and we're, we're doing better, but there's a, a long way to go. Now, uh, this is a, a slide from Greg Lavelle at ConocoPhillips, and he uses the slide to emphasize the, the, you know, the resource potential and points out that recoverable resources from you know, the major plays that we, we all know about you know, exceed the largest oil fields in the world. So these are truly global class resources. The, the Bureau of Economic Geology uh, has looked at, well, how many wells might be drilled? And this is a, a slide from Svetlana Ikonikova. And in, in compiling um, these estimates, she said, let's drill only where drilling is already allowed. Let's drill with a density of wells that's more or less comparable to what um, you know, has been done in the past. And let's restrict ourselves to formations that we already know about. Okay, so there's no, you know, hypothetical new discoveries. And the numbers are, are truly, you know, outstanding. If you look at all the plays with the exception of the Permian, there could be 600,000 more wells drilled. If you look at the Permian alone, because of stack pay, there could be a million wells drilled. The numbers, you know, could boggle the mind. So the way to think about this is that it's almost unlimited potential. Okay, it doesn't mean any of this is going to be done and we're going to decarbonize the energy system over the next 50 or so years. But nonetheless, the resource is there if we're smart enough to extract it in an um, economically viable way. And, and the slides are not changing. Could you? Thank you. Um, and, you know, the global estimates that have been out, uh, you know, in the public domain for quite a while are beginning to show some potential, especially the Vaca Muerta in Argentina and shale gas in China have really been picking up in the last couple of years, and, and there's lots of potential in other places as well. Now, none of us know what the future holds, um, and the longer we, um, we sort of extrapolate, maybe the smarter we think we get. Um, I feel kind of comfortable thinking over scales of, uh, you know, 10 to 20 years, and if you look at a lot of different estimates, this one is from BP, but the numbers from the US EIA or the International Energy Agency aren't very different, that in 2040, the energy mix is going to be more or less the same amount of oil as we currently use, more or less, sadly, the same amount of coal that we currently burn. But the increase in energy to provide the growing economies of the world, uh, to drive those economies, is going to come from natural gas and renewables. Okay? Now keep that in mind, all right? Oil and coal more or less constant for the next 20 years, more natural gas and, and more renewables. Before going on, there, you know, there's going to be a session later in the day on public sentiment. And, you know, depending on where you live, uh, there's, there's a lot of pushback. Uh, and, you know, you cannot deny that horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing are large-scale industrial processes that are impactful. Now, these impacts are multifold. There are community issues. Uh, uh, induced seismicity is one I've, I've worked on quite a bit. Atmospheric issues, uh, local air quality, greenhouse gases. There are land issues, uh, ecosystem impacts. And there are certainly a lot of water issues, depending on where you are. Uh, the water issues uh, vary from place to place. But in this paper that uh, Doug Arendt and I uh, put out a few years ago, our only point was that there are large-scale environmental impacts associated with essentially every industrial process. And our challenge is to really understand each of these impacts, define best practice, establish appropriate regulations, and enforce those regulations. And if the public is confident that we're engaged in that process, we can, you know, we can proceed. If they think we're stonewalling and ignoring these issues, that's when I think the trouble begins. And I'm looking forward to the discussion later this afternoon. Now, um, issues with improving recovery factors are multifold. Uh, I've just listed a few here optimizing the development of stack pay. This is a 
huge issue, especially in the Permian Basin, and it's happening today. Improving recovery factors, optimizing well spacing, controlling well-to-well -well interaction, um, and so on. Now, what could be the bad news is I've just written a 500-page book on this topic. Um, it's available from Kindle and Cambridge uh, in a couple of weeks. It'll make a great Christmas gift, I, ass I assure you. I am not, I am not going to, you know, blast a number of slides here and, uh, and bore you to death. Um, I'm going to show one example that kind of combines three of these topics, uh, how it relates to stack pay, choosing optimal landing zones, and limiting vertical fracture growth. And it's a, it's a real case. The reason for talking about this now is the issue of stack pay in the Permian, where in this particular um, figure, which is just anonymous, I, I got it off the web, illustrates the p potential for seven wells to be drilled in this stack of, of low permeability oil bearing formations. Basically the Sprayberry Wolf Camp sequence, if you're familiar with it. Now, the one thing you, the only thing you really have to remember about hydraulic fracturing is it's controlled by the magnitude of the least principal stress and the orientation of the least principal stress. In other words, the hydraulic fracture is going to open and propagate in a manner that requires the least energy. And this was shown originally in sandbox experiments in the early 1950s by M. King Hubbard. So when we think about what's going to happen when we do multiple hydraulic fractures in each of these wells, it really depends on what's happening with the the magnitude of the, and orientation of the least principal stress. Now here's, here's the example I'm going to show. It's real data from the northeastern United States, and it shows measurements of the magnitude of the least principal stress through the sedimentary sequence. Now what's labeled as formation D is the pay zone. That's where the hydrocarbons are. And what we demonstrated through this modeling is that because the least principal stress is lower above the reservoir in, in B and C, that when you do the hydraulic fracturing, so what you're looking at is you're looking at the, that each hydraulic fracture propagating out of one perforation cluster in one stage, the hydraulic fractures are growing upward, not outward. The color represents where the propent winds up going. The point of this is to illustrate using, you know, representative but not actual uh, parameters for how the perforations are done, the pumping rate, the propent load, um, and so on is that in this particular case, you're doing a very good job of stimulating production from formations that have no hydrocarbons in them. So this issue of fracture growth is absolutely critical. And what we're doing now is working with the operator to try to find the optimal con combination of parameters so that we can adapt what's done in the field to the condition that the earth presents to us. We can't do anything about that. Now, what does this have to do with stack pay? Well, you can take this, this middle formation, which is representative of the Sprayberry Shale, where this nice geometric pattern of a sometimes called wine rack pattern um, is, is being laid out, where uh, a well near the top, a well in the middle, and a well near, near the bottom. But what geology is going to say is that that hydraulic fracture is going to want to propagate up, or it's going to want to propagate down, but it's not going to want to do both. Okay, so before we lay out these patterns and we know how many wells have to be drilled, do we have to drill all seven layers? Can we get away with fewer wells? Can we make the, each of the wells, you know, more productive? We really have to understand first what the earth is doing and then design our operational parameters to, to deal with what geology presents to us. Okay, um, what I want to do now is, is make four quick points about the oil and gas industry in the era of decarbonization. The first is that this new global abundance of natural gas, which is both unconventional gas and, and some major discoveries of conventional gas around the world, provide a, an immediate opportunity of decarbonizing the electrical systems of countries around the world. They're in desperate need of energy. Right now they're turning to coal. There's a lot of natural gas. Let's have them make the right decision as they move forward. The second is if you look at the other end of the spectrum, a well-developed, the fifth largest economy in the world, California, which has some very ambitious decarbonization goals, I want to mention at least briefly the role of, of hydrocarbons in meeting those goals. 
The third is a role for hydrocarbons, most specifically uh, natural gas liquids, propane, in providing a thermal fuel for the develop developing world. And the final point is the importance of the oil and gas industry in carbon capture and sequestration. So what do we know? We know in the United States that simply driven by market conditions and the availability of abundant and inexpensive gas, there's been a tremendous switch from coal to natural gas for generating electricity, and associated with that, there's been a major decrease in CO2 emissions. And of course, these increases of natural gas production over the past decade have been in an era of very low prices. And this is the advantage that the efficiency of operations brings us, that you can actually make money and provide gas at two and a half bucks a million BTU and actually drive this fuel switching from coal to, to natural gas. It's happening and it's working. When we look around the world, this uh, particular slide is from Exxon, what we know is that the increase of CO2 emissions are going to come from the developing world, both in the North America and Europe, Japan, you know, emissions are, are declining. And so while they're declining, they're increasing dramatically, driven by economic development, driven by uh, the, the heavy use of coal. Because as we speak today, there are about 300 gigawatts of coal generation capacity under construction in Asia. To put 300 gigawatts in perspective, we now have about 300 gigawatts of coal burning capacity um, in the United States. So if we were to shut down every coal burning power plant, replace it with renewables, the decrease in emissions that would result in the United States would be offset by the increase in the emissions that are coming from power plants that are currently under construction. So this is a global issue not just a local issue. And as we all know, um, economic development depends on energy, and we need, to provide, we need to provide that energy to drive the economic development, and we need to provide that energy as cleanly as possible. You, you look at some of the numbers and you say, well, you know, importing LNG into India at, say, $7 a million BTU, be it um, versus uh, domestic coal at $2 a million BTU or so, uh, 2.7 was used in this calculation, uh, that's insurmountable, right? They're always going to choose coal over natural gas. Well, in a natural gas brief written by Mark Thurber, an economist at Stanford, he pointed out that if you start accounting for other issues, um, the balance changes quite quickly. You can account for, say, health and air quality issues. Uh, Putting a number on that's difficult, but if you do, uh, it, it, it pushes the balance toward natural gas. In this case, he said, What's a, what, what kind of carbon price does it take? And the analysis showed that a very low carbon price, $22 uh, a, a, a ton, is enough to actually make coal cheaper. So as we sort of think about energy on a global scale, we have to, you know, not only caught, you know, consider the dollars per BTU, we have to consider the total impact of the energy choices, both in the short term and the long term. And as, as we communicate this, hopefully more, um, more effective uh, solutions will be found as, you know, for the countries that are hu hungry in energy and all too frequently uh, turn to coal. Let's talk about the other end of the spectrum, and let's talk about California. This is a slide um, from the Energy Futures Initiative, headed by uh, former Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz, and this is uh, courtesy of, of Melanie Kinder, Kinderdine, who you'll meet uh, this afternoon. It's, a, it's basically a timeline, and you, without going into the details, what the circles are, are highlighting are the carbon reduction goals that have been mandated through various laws that have been passed by the state of California. And so if you just look at 2030, which, you know, some of us, some of us recognize as basically tomorrow, um, you know, we're expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990 levels 
by 40% overall, and electricity uh, in the state has to be 60% uh, renewable. Okay, those are, those are high bars to achieve. Well, um, the, the point of this uh, study by the Energy Futures Initiative was to look at options. You know, what is available to enable these goals to be met? And one of the first things that required attention is where is the CO2 coming from? So in, in the public's mind, you know, if we shut down the power plants and do everything with, with um, solar panels and, uh, and wind farms, and I've got solar panels at home and I generate basically all of my electricity for free now that they've been paid off over seven years. Uh, in point of fact, in California, 16% of the CO2 is coming from electrical power generation, but 39% is coming from transportation, which is a much more difficult way, you know, a system to, to de decarbonize, and, and the other numbers are, are there. And the conclusion of, of the study um, and what has been now transmitted to the, uh, the governor and the policymakers in the state is that if we're going to have a chance of meeting these goals, it's going to require a lot of natural gas, it's going to require auto efficiency standards to maintain the, the highly efficient standards that are now in place and perhaps to make them even more stringent, and we're going to have to get serious about storing carbon in the subsurface. Now, I just want to make a note about energy poverty, and, and you're all familiar with the dire need of, for energy, um, but there's some aspects in much of the world, and, and there's um, some aspects of this that might not be fully appreciated. This is a slide that either my wife or I took uh, in the Pamir Mountains of western China. It's at about 14,000 feet elevation. They're the summer pastures where the uh, local people bring their yaks and and, and sheep to graze in the summertime. So this is a summer hut. If you look closely, you can see a solar panel and you can see a satellite dish. That's pretty cool for shepherds. Um, but the smoke coming out of the smokestack is coming from burning dung for heat and for cooking. And in point of fact, you know, there's four million premature deaths a year caused by indoor air pollution, burning sticks and dung or whatever's available for, for heat and for cooking. And this four million deaths per year is more than AIDS, tubercul tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Now this issue had been completely ignored by sort of the international uh, NGO system, which was focusing on um, you know, providing solar panels and uh, electrical power, and that's great but it was not sufficient. And this, they, there's finally the recognition that a thermal fuel is needed. And in fact, India is in the process of providing tens of millions of propane canisters to rural households to enable them you know, to cook and, and provide heating with, with, with propane, um, as opposed to spending hours and hours a day burning fuels that ultimately are uh, damaging their health very severely. Now, I'm showing this slide again because I want to make the point that all these good things that are happening, increases in energy efficiency, electrification of, of uh, light duty vehicles, um, extended use of, of renewables, all of these good things aren't reducing the amount of carbon that's going into the atmosphere. They're simply lowering the rate at which the carbon is going up. The only way to actually reduce the carbon that's been emitted is, is through carbon capture and storage in the subsurface. It's the only way we know of right now. And I want to talk about this challenge in the context of goals that have been defined by the oil and gas industry itself. The OGCI was 10 companies, principally international companies, committed to the role of the oil and gas industry in the context of global climate change. Uh, in September of 2018, Exxon, Chevron, and, and Oxy uh, joined the OGCI. Now, what I'm about to show you in terms of how much carbon we need to be storing in the subsurface to meet the two degree uh, warming limit uh, defined in the Paris Accords um, 
is, is coming from the OGCI, but the IEA is very, uh, very similar, Shell is, is very similar. And so what, you, what I'm showing here is how much CO2 needs to be stored in the subsurface as a function of time between 2014 and 2016, 60, excuse me. Now, this looks like a cumulative plot, but it's really not. This is how much CO2 needs to be stored in the subsurface per year. Now, let me put these numbers, gigatons of CO2, which you, know, you may not be able to just visualize what we're talking about. Let me put it in some context. Right now, if you look at all the CCS projects around the world, we're injecting about 30 million tons of CO2 per year for storage. So we're not even off the horizontal line. At 2040, we're expected to be at about three and a half gigatons of CO2 per year. So what does that mean? The CO2 is injected as a supercritical fluid. It's, you know, it's not a liquid, it's not a gas, but it's a lot more like a liquid than it is a gas. Its density is about 0.6 of that of water, and so you can think of a volume uh, very easily. And it turns out that three and a half billion tons of CO2 is the same amount of liquid as 30 billion barrels of oil. 30 billion barrels is the size of the global oil system. That's how much oil is being produced, distributed, uh, processed, and consumed every year. So what we're talking about is an infrastructure 20 years from now that's handling the same volume of fluid that the oil and gas, the, well, the oil infrastructure um, is now handling. And of course, it was developed over a, a hundred years and driven by uh, economic incentives. Okay, so this scale is pretty mind boggling. In fact, by mid century, we've got to be twice that scale. So if we're going to move the needle, if we're going to start reducing carbon in the atmosphere, which all of the modelers say, you know, just stabilizing is good but not enough, we really have to start reducing the amount of carbon we're, we're, we're emitting very significantly, and we have to take carbon out of the atmosphere if we possibly can. The only way of getting rid of carbon is actually putting it into the subsurface at an enormous scale. That's the point. If you look at various scenarios, this is the Shell Sky scenario. So this is the one billion tons uh, in the next few years. It goes to um, five gigatons um, by uh, 2050, and we're at three times the scale of the global oil and gas industry by the end of the century. So this doesn't stop. This doesn't you know, solve the problem. To solve the problem, we need sort of an all of the above strategy, but decarbonization is going to be very, very difficult, and, uh, and the scale at which we have to do it uh, is simply enormous. Now, the idea of storing carbon in the subsurface is, 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 is not new. Uh, this slide from the IPCC in 2005, you know, talked about all the many, the many options. To date, most of the work done in the United States and abroad looking at this issue has really focused on saline aquifers, you know, thick, porous, permeable formations in the subsurface filled with salty water. So they have no economic value. Uh, they're not in contact with the biosphere. But the challenge of using these saline aquifers are, are pretty enormous. First, the time to develop the infrastructure is going to take literally trillions of dollars and decades to do. Issues of liability and the need for continuous monitoring for hundreds of years have really not you know, been worked out. Um, the difficulty of obtaining and maintaining a, a social license to operate is just going to be enormous if we're starting to pump these huge amounts of buoyant toxic fluid uh, below the subsurface. And you know, my part of the equation is to look at the geologic side and the pore space into which we're doing the injection is already occupied. It's, they're not voids in the subsurface, they're voids filled with, with salt water. So when you inject these huge mounts, the pressure goes up and the pressure spreads out literally over hundreds of kilometers. So it's a really uh, enormous challenge to think about any saline aquifer where we currently know nothing. 
There's no wells that have been drilled in it. There's no, been, no studies of that. And so we'd have to start with zero information, collect the data to characterize it, and start working in a licensing and approval process and somehow bring the public along during that process. It's almost unimaginable to think of this happening over a, a, a 10 or 20 year period. So where does that bring us? It brings us to a conclusion I've reached, and I hope a rationale you, at least, if you don't agree, you at least understand, that the massive injection of CO2 into depleted oil and gas reservoirs is the only realistic pathway to significantly reduce carbon uh, in the atmosphere over the time scale of about 20 years. So it's the scale, both in volume and the scale in time, that drives at least me to this conclusion. Why? Well, the oil and gas industry has existing knowledge of the subsurface, much of the infrastructure is already in place, and the pore space to accommodate the CO2 is being created every year through oil production. We need to, to uh, basically store one year's worth of production. Well, we've been creating that poor space for many years. So we have poor space in the bank, which is a little bit of an abstract concept, but it, I, I think you know what I mean. We have the space to accommodate it. And there's the potential for a positive impact on production. So we know what to do, we know where it can go, and we now have some uh, tax credits like 45Q that can help change the economics. Now there's some glitches in 45Q and there's not been a massive uptake of this opportunity yet, but um, you know, it, it's easy to see CO2 injection into depleted oil and gas reservoirs scale up uh, very dramatically uh, in the next few years. And my argument is it has to, or we're not going to be able to decarbonize and meet uh, societal goals. So, the, you know, my concluding um, remarks are basically that I see the oil industry of the future, future being the next 20 to 30 years, um, an industry which is making money by producing oil and gas. That's not going to stop. It's not going to go away. It's critically important that the industry do this. But at the same time, is also in the business in the business of injecting and storing CO2 into depleted oil and gas reservoirs if, in fact, these uh, decarbonization goals, these limits on, on global warming and global change are going to be realized. One final word um, uh, about the Natural Gas Initiative at Stanford. If you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to provide more information. Our next event is a, uh, a workshop on unconventional development. It's going to be May 30th. If anyone is uh, interested attend in attending, you're, you're, you're welcome to do so. And we, we're having future workshops on a wide variety of issues, which are, are shown in this very colorful diagram. Thank, thank you very much. So thanks, Mark, for kicking us off. And I think, if nothing else, just conveying the scale of these challenges is mind-boggling. But having people like Mark doing the work that he's doing uh, is really impressive. 